Hey guys, so today I'm making a really special video to introduce you to one of my strange hobbies, which is collecting bones. It's something I've been fascinated with for quite some time now, and I've had the opportunity and privilege to actually build a collection of my own. And I'd love to show you guys some of this stuff and just talk to you about some of these animals. I really enjoy bones because I think it shows the beauty of life because even what it leaves behind is incredible. So that's what inspires me about it, but it's not for everybody. It can be kind of weird, so I'm not trying to be a weirdo. So I'm going to introduce you to some of my bones that are in my collection. These are all my personally collected specimens. They are all legally obtained or they've died of natural causes. Um, some of these, I think only one or two of these have strict federal regulations on them so if I ever tried to sell it I would need to provide proper paperwork because animal trafficking and the black market is a huge problem for many many species so we always want to be aware of that and make sure that any specimens we keep in our collections are sustainably sourced and of course legal so all of these are legally obtained and legally collected and they died of natural causes so I'm going to introduce you to some of these very cool specimens of mine. I think I'm going to start with the most vibrant one, which is the radiated tortoise. This incredible tortoise is one of the most endangered reptiles on the planet. They come from Madagascar, which is a biodiverse hotspot of the world. Madagascar is the fourth largest island on the planet that's off the coast of Africa, and these animals face extreme challenges because of human impact. So these human impacts include slash and burn agriculture, which is deforestation, so it takes away their habitat, and also they are huge on the black market. People are taking them from the wild, and they also take them for bush meat. So there are some communities that feast upon this species. And again, most tortoises and turtles take many, many years decades to become sexually mature when there are many taken away that really hurts their population they already are slow to reproduce so this is another reason why they are critically endangered so the radiated tortoise astrochelis radiata is a beautiful tortoise from madagascar and these colorations are completely natural um, every tortoise of this species has their own pattern kind of like humans have fingerprints or snowflakes are individual, it's the same concept. So these animals have incredibly beautiful radiated patterns, which is how they got their common name. And this specimen came from my mentor, Jason Abels, who had um, this animal die of natural causes, and he created this for me, which I'm so, so grateful for. Jason has contributed, I think, almost every single one of these specimens that I have in my bone collection. That's actually how I met him, was through networking about bones. And ever since then, getting introduced to 3Js has been one of the best points in my life. So I'm super grateful for that and super grateful that he donated this specimen into my bone collection. So this is the radiated tortoise. Um, they are herbivorous and from Madagascar. And they are incredibly and beautiful critically endangered and they're facing a lot of challenges. This animal was in captivity and was bred in captivity, so it was not taken from the wild. And thankfully they actually do pretty well in captivity, but they have low fertility rates. So that means even if they're laying eggs, they're not really fertile all the time. So they don't have the best odds, but they are doing well in captivity. So we have assurance colonies that we can make sure these animals stay on the planet, even if they go extinct in the wild, which I hope doesn't happen. I believe it's the TSA, Turtle Survival Alliance, that has the repatriation program going on in Madagascar, which is incredible. So before um, any animals that were confiscated from the black market, they could never be released back into the, the wild, into Madagascar. But now, the Turtle Survival Alliance, which is an incredible conservation group working to save turtles and tortoises from extinction, has a quarantine facility now that it's actually possible to repatriate or put them back into the wild after they've been confiscated. 
So there is hope for captive breeding that perhaps they could be released into the wild with a similar program. So the radiated tortoise is incredible. And just a, a couple more facts about tortoises in general. Their shell is made of keratin, which is the same protein that makes our fingernails and hair. So they're 100% able to feel when you touch them. On this side, there's a scoot that fell out. Some of my bones got a little damaged in between me moving and then I moved them into my classroom here. But you can see, it's actually pretty cool, that right underneath this very thin, beautiful shell is bone. So it's very, very sensitive. They can definitely feel it. And sometimes when you scratch tortoises, they like to wiggle their butt because it feels good. So that is the radiated tortoise of Madagascar and definitely one of my prized possessions in my collection. I don't believe I would ever, ever sell these specimens, but if I did, because this animal's critically endangered and federally protected under the Endangered Species Act, um, I would never be able to sell this to like another person in another state or maybe even within my own state, I'm not 100% sure, without providing proper documentation that this was a captive animal, legal animal, legally obtained, and so on. So, incredible animal that I'm very privileged and blessed to have in my bone collection. Unfortunately, it did pass because of natural causes, but we're able to still appreciate them even like this. So, that is the radiated tortoise. So, the next one I'm gonna talk to you about is this bizarre looking skull right here. So, I'm not sure if you've ever seen this. Unfortunately, the bottom portion um, has two jaw pieces that broke um, during storage when it was in my storage boxes. So I've actually tried to super glue it, but it's, it, it didn't work yesterday. So I kind of just had them to the side right now. But this is actually a species of deer called a munt jack. So the muntjac deer is also called the barking deer, and that's because they have a cry that sounds like a bark. These animals are native to Southeast Asia, India, and China, but now they are established in parts of Europe like Britain and France. But they are not native to Europe. They are native to Southeast Asia. So you can see here that the muntjac has tusks and it also has horns, which is pretty rare to have both. So these guys are Actually super, super cute. <laughs> These are used for both social status, fighting, and impressing the ladies. So they have these rows of teeth back here that are kind of like molars, but then they have these prominent tusks. So they use both within their lifestyles and habitats, and the munchak deer is it's just very, very cool. So take a look at the back of the skull. I'm gonna show you as many as I can of this structure right here. This this hole is the foramen magnum, and this leads to the brain. So this is a cavity that leads to the brain and the spinal cord passes through. So you're actually able to see how large the brain is by looking at this structure, and it's really interesting to compare different animals. And if you're able to connect intelligence, which again, we understand intelligence only from a human perspective, so it's kind of hard to place animals into that category, but Morphologically and anatomically, being able to see the size of the brain definitely influences an animal's lifestyle and habits. So this guy has a pretty large form in magnum, which means they're probably pretty smart. So the munchak deer is a solitary animal and it's also nocturnal. So it's pretty interesting, these animals' lifestyle and also their appearance. There's about seven species of munchak deer. They're all in the genus Untiasis, I believe, and then the family Cervidae. So again, about seven different species that are native to Southeast Asia. I think what I love most about this skull it are these antlers, which are pretty impressive. But the munchak deer is something I've never seen in person, but they are, you know, they're not extinct, they're around, they're really, really cute, and they have a pretty badass structure. So I really appreciate that in their osteology. The next skulls that I'm gonna to talk to you about are gonna to be together because we see them quite often. Unfortunately, a lot of the times on the road or they're considered pests, um, they're considered kind of bad to carry rabies. So what do you think these two are? These two are actually the opossum and the raccoon. 
So I'm going to introduce you to these two specimens together because we see them very often. It's really cool to actually compare them because they have similar lifestyles, but they're very different anatomically and behaviorally. But we're gonna discuss that because their bones might have something to do with their behavior as well. So on my right, here is our raccoon, the trash panda, we all know and love. We're gonna compare them and talk about them a little bit. The skull on my left right here is the United States possum, a nocturnal animal, but this is actually the United States' only marsupial, which is, means it's an animal with a pouch. So they have a pouch that carries their babies, and if you know anything about marsupials, they actually give birth, and then the tiny little babies are about the size of a rice grain, and they have to climb up the fur to find the pouch. That's probably the most intense journey I could ever imagine, and a lot of them probably don't make it. So this is the same for kangaroos, for wallabies, for the Tasmanian devil. The possum is the United States' only marsupial, and the mom is such a good mama. She carries all the babies on her back, and a lot of people have the stigma that opossums carry rabies, but they actually help prevent rabies because they eat ticks, they eat mites, they eat all those nasty little parasitic things that we don't like so much. So next time you see an opossum, don't be too scared. I'm sure you've seen them. If you've ever come in contact, they make this hideous face that's quite scary, but that's only because they're scared. And that's where I want to talk to you about their bones because the foramen magnum I showed you on the munchak, you know, every skull is gonna have that, that has a spinal cord. If you actually take a look at the comparison between a raccoon, foramen magnum, and the opossum, the opossum's is super, super small, like the size of a bean, really. So this shows the difference in brain size. So the raccoons are much smarter than the opossum, so the fight or flight response is going to be much quicker in the possum, which is why they immediately make that crazy face, than the raccoon. The raccoon might stand its ground more and even has been known to attack like dogs and stuff. So definitely watch your back with them, but the opossum is usually not going to probably attack you. They're just really scared. So if you see them, they have a really tiny brain. They're not the smartest animals in the world. So just keep that into consideration when you think that maybe that means they, they're gonna attack. They're really just terrified because they have no clue what's going on. That's, that's what I generally believe. So again, it's a really cool part of zoology to compare osteology. Osteology just means bones. Because this is a way we can help classify them, this is a way we can help understand them better, maybe even understand their behaviors, which be, could be connected to their anatomy. So that's the raccoon and the opossum. This guy over here, one of my absolute favorite parts of my collection, and you can see that he doesn't look as professional as these other ones maybe, because he was not professionally preserved. These were all purchased from a professional taxidermist, whereas this skull was kind of left to do its own thing. This animal actually belonged to a friend of mine who donated this skull. This is an alligator snapping turtle. This is the largest freshwater turtle in the United States. It's endemic to the southeastern United States, and they're just an incredible species. They're very large, they have an incredibly powerful bite, and they're the only known reptile that has oral luring. So on their tongues, they have these appendages. resemble worms or larvae that are in the water. This is a fully aquatic animal. They do come out of the water because they have legs to lay their eggs as well. So they are fully aquatic though. So one of their predatory mechanisms is opening their mouth, which is super impressive. And they usually sit vertically. They sit vertically like, and then they just wait. They use their tongue to wiggle it around and catch fish and other things. Um, it's actually unknown what their specific diet is in the wild, but they're most likely very opportunistic. So they'll eat meat, they'll eat veggies, and probably anything that they can get. So that definitely includes fish, which they lure. Alligator snapping turtle is the only extant species of the macrolemis, which is pretty impressive because historically and in the fossil record, these turtles were massive. 
some of the biggest. So people might get this alligator snapping turtle confused with the common snapping turtle, which is much smaller, it has a much smaller head, and they're just a different species altogether. Now it is still happening that people in the United States eat snapping turtles, but that has definitely slowed down due to the decline in populations. This species is not federally protected, but state by state, the regulations and the protection is different depending on where you go. It was actually petitioned for them to be on the endangered species list in 1980s, somewhere around there, but in 1984 that petition got denied based on lack of data and lack of research. So this is another part of why zoology and conservation and biology is so important because without the research to support these animals we can't legally protect them in many cases. So it's not just about being out in nature and like rainbows and butterflies and touching animals and taking pictures with them. It's about the legalities behind it and that's why we need researchers to support these animals because they don't have a voice. And it's a professional industry that we need to do a little better with. So the Endangered Species Act was created in 1973 which federally protects the species within it like the radiated tortoise. So it would be amazing to protect the United States' largest freshwater turtle. Well, let's take a look at their form in Magnum. Reptiles in general are not known for being the smartest animals in the animal kingdom, so even though this animal is massive, I believe this is their form in Magnum. Unless there's pieces missing, that's pretty small. Pretty small. So definitely be careful when you're working with these. There's a very specific way to handle them, and this could take your hand clean off. Clean amputation with a bite from the sky. Turtles and tortoises are the only reptiles without teeth, but they have these beaks and these appendages that are extremely strong. So they got their name snapping turtle because when they catch their prey, they snap it down their throat. Okay, snap it down. <laughs> really incredible animal. Thank you so much to Fred who donated this to me. You're an angel, we all know this. So, that's about all the time I have today to talk to you about these bones in my bone collection. But I will pick up this video another day and record it fully and I will be back. So I hope you enjoyed this part. Oh wait, I'm, I'm just gonna. Okay, thank you very much. See you another day.